Okay, moving on now to DNA. There are so many of us. Um, we see posts constantly on Hellenic Genealogy Geek and also um, other Greek genealogy websites, including the DNA site. Um, I don't recall the exact name of it, DNA in Greek Genealogy. Um, that people are just, you know, they're they're getting their DNA tests, they're getting results, and it's freaking them out because it's not what they're expecting. So we're going to turn the time over to Sam Williams for a few minutes. Let me tell you just a minute about Sam. He is a professional genealogist, and he focuses um, in the United States on Central Virginia, which is a state south of Washington D.C., African American and Greek American research. Sam has a degree in international affairs and Spanish from James Madison University. And he also has a master of divinity from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Sam is a pastoral assistant at St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church in Virginia Beach. So Sam, welcome. We are really excited for your presentation. Um, can you just help us understand what the varying ethnicities are that people with Greek families are seeing in their DNA tests and kind of give us some guidance as far as testing is concerned. We always get questions as far as, well, you know, which company should I test with and where do I upload my data? So we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for being with us. Go ahead on. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm happy to be with all of you. And and I'm going to be addressing directly that those questions. You know, the, there's so much anxiety that especially Greeks get when they get their DNA test results and they see their ethnicity estimate and they say, I'm not really Greek or, oh, I know I'm actually Turkish and it's going to show it. And then it doesn't necessarily show that. So I hope that's enough of a teaser. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with all of you uh, so that I can begin this presentation on using DNA in Greek genealogy. And as Carol said, my name is Sam Williams and I'm the Orthodox genealogist. And I work to connect families and encounter ancestors both for myself and for my clients. And today, what we're gonna be looking at in a brief 30 minutes, I'm gonna do my, my best to get all of this information to you as clearly as possible within the 30 minutes that I have with all of you. And where we're going in this presentation is we're gonna be first looking at how to get started with building a tree and connecting our DNA results with a tree. Because this, what we're discussing is actually called genetic genealogy. And using DNA for the purpose of learning about your family is only useful in as much as you're able to connect to actual records. So that's the first point. Then we're gonna be looking at understanding Greek migration to actually understand the history of what does it mean to be a Greek and how might that history influence the results that you're getting from your DNA test. And then this question, it says I'm not 100% Greek. So now we're gonna understand how to look at these ethnicity estimates for people of Greek heritage. And then we're last gonna look at how to get the most out of the tools that is offered especially by Ancestry DNA. But within this presentation, I'm gonna show some ethnicity results from both 23andMe and MyHeritage because of the importance of these three companies in um, consumer databases, but also in the use of ethnicity. As a silent icebreaker, just among all of you that are watching us and joining us live, who among you has had a DNA test? Have you tested with Ancestry DNA, with 23andMe, with MyHeritage? And if you haven't tested with any of these, why haven't you? And there are different concerns that people might have and, and those are valid, but I would like to encourage you that if you are working to learn more about your ancestry, a DNA test is more than just ethnicity results. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So first things first, we need to start a tree. It can be as simple as you have, um, but just, go ahead and start a simple tree, especially on Ancestry or on 23andMe, you can upload a tree there and make it public. Um, if you're not working on a tree for an adoptee, if you're an adoptee, I might recommend it staying private just for kind of the purpose of you working it out still, but keep your tree public. But even if it's public, the living names, those who are alive are not going to be listed. 
but this will help so that you can collaborate with cousins that you find online. You're gonna start with yourself, use both parents' names and your grandparents' names, and then whatever great-grandparents' names you might have. Even if it's just their first name, these are important and helpful tools to begin your simple tree. And then of course, you can build upon this foundation moving forward. And I said, uh, as a caveat, adoptees can't begin with a biological tree, but as adoptees use their DNA test results in the, in the strategies that we're gonna be talking about today, adoptees can start to build an actual biological tree that can help them determine the names of their biological parents. So we are gonna to wanna to start by attaching your DNA results, which is something you can do on Ancestry DNA to attach your DNA results to yourself in your tree. And then by linking your DNA results to this tree, it'll help you get all of the amazing tools that are available there. And the more detail you include in your tree, the easier it's going to be for you to connect with these DNA test matches that pop up in your list. But if you don't have a subscription to Ancestry, uh, you're still going to be able to see certain features. You're still going to be able to see an initial detail on other people's trees, but you won't be able to view those trees necessarily. But if you do have a subscription, you'll have access to those trees. Just something to notice. And as another caveat, if you've purchased your Ancestry DNA test results before October of 2014, it kind of grandfathers you in and you have more access. Now, this is what it looks like when you are looking at the homepage of Ancestry DNA. This is mine. Uh, my first name's Walter. Um, you're gonna see DNA story always to the left, your DNA matches in the center, and then something called through lines all the way on the right. And this is there's different tools that Ancestry has. And we're gonna be discussing these different tools and how it's relevant for you moving forward in the la latter part of this presentation. But here, uh, there's a way that you can link your DNA test results to a tree. And this is the general way, um, kind of the process of working through that, linking it to a tree and then finding that you are attached. But before, after we've, you know, had a simple tree and you've taken your DNA test results, but how do you understand what it means to be a Greek more than just a cultural phenomenon? This idea of being a Greek, and, and this is complicated and sensitive, so bear with me, y'all. Um, it's complicated, and it really depends on who are the Greeks, depends on who you ask and when you ask them, what time period we're discussing what it meant to be a Greek. In the mid-5th century before Christ, Herodotus said that a Greek was someone that had shared blood, shared language, shared religion, and shared customs. But then during the Roman Empire, the Hellenes, which is something that we think of as, as Greeks, right? Hellenes, Hellenes, really denoted pagans, it denoted non-Christians, uh, polytheists. And then we get this idea of the Rome. So Rome, what does that mean? Rome means Romans. But Rome were not people from Rome. Rome were Greek speakers. And this is really vital to understand, especially if you have Asia Minor ancestry or if your ancestors were from Constantinople, because the Greek Orthodox of Asia Minor, of Smyrna, of Constantinople, they refer to themselves as Rome. They're Romans, not because they were ever from Rome or ever from Italy, but this is a, a, a more truer sense of what it meant to be a Greek for them, because they were never from the country of Greece. They had always been from Asia Minor, but they identified as Romans. Because remember, what was the second capital of the Roman Empire? Constantinople. So the Romans, it stopped meaning just Rome. It, it meant a larger empire. And modern day Greek speakers from Asia Minor hold on to this tradition. But then later on, the sense of identity of what it meant to be a Greek was defined differently by the Greek constitution in 1822 meant being an Orthodox Christian. And with the Treaty of Lucerne in 1923, it also meant being an Orthodox Christian. We're gonna to get to that later when we talk about the exchange of populations. But as identity has evolved after the 19th century, we see that there are multiple minority groups within Greece 
And all of these minority groups, although they identify with their minority ethnicity, they fundamentally identify as Greeks, as patriotic Greeks, regardless of their religion or their minority status or the minority language they speak. For example, Romaniotis or Ladinos, who are Jewish Greeks, Slavica speakers from around Greece, Vlaches, who speak Vla uh, Vlahica, which is a, a re relative uh, language of Romanian, Arvenites, which speak a relative of Albanian, etc. All of these individuals identify as Greek and their faith may or may not be a determining factor. Now let's look at some brief history on what kind of influenced this idea of being Greek and where was it spread. So I want us to look just briefly, we're looking at second century Christianity. This is the Mediterranean in the second century, 150 years or so after the time of Christ. And all those dots are where the Christian church was present. Mostly, if you'll notice, mostly in the Middle East and in Asia Minor and in Greece. And what caused Christianity to spread so rapidly? It was a shared spoken language, a lingua franca that was Greek, not because they were all from Greece, but because that was a language brought to them by earlier uh, uh, periods. And so this, as Christianity is spreading, it's spreading because of this reality of a shared language already. And when we look at the Roman Empire by mid to late third uh, century, mid to late 200s, the, you're looking here at a, pic, a map of Asia Minor and Greece. The dark gray is where Greek was mostly spoken. And the light gray, as you go further off of the Mediterranean, you see Greek is still widely spoken, but not entirely. And you have these other languages like Coptic and Greek in, uh, in Egypt. Arabic, Aramaic, Armenian, Latin being spoken in different minority areas, also further away from the Mediterranean. Here's another map showing a similar thing in the sixth century. The dark blue is where Greek is the predominant language. The light blue is where Greek is being spoken along with another native language. Notice North Africa. Notice all of Asia Minor and deeper into the, uh, the Balkans. And then also southern southeast Sicily, there are still villages today in the south of Italy that speak an ancient form of Greek in the same way as there are uh, Turks in the north of, of Pontus in modern Turkey that still speak an ancient Greek language. This is another map of the same sort of information. I just wanted to demonstrate uh, how widely spread Greek was even amongst other languages which again influences identity. Now let's fast forward to ethnic communities within Asia Minor leading up to 1910. And all of the red are people that identified or were identified as Turks. The blue dots, which you notice are all along the water and even within Central Asia Minor. These are Greek communities or Greek speaking or Greek identified individuals. Further to the east were other ethnic groups. Here's another map showing a similar thing, showing different types of Greek dialects, for example, Demotic, Pontic, Cappadocian. And um, this really begs the question, right? If there's people speaking all types of Greek all over Asia Minor, even by 1910, where did all those Greeks go before? How did all of these people in Central Asia Minor, how did that get cultivated by the Turks? We have to remember that the Turks didn't just come out of nowhere and the Greeks didn't just disappear. A lot of this is a centuries long process of assimilation and conversion. And this is going to affect the ethnic uh, ethnicity results of not only Greeks, but of Turks because of shared history in these time periods. Here's also another map showing the same thing coming from National Geographic in 1918, showing the presence of Greeks all over Asia Minor, Cyprus, and, uh, and Southern Balkans. Now something really big happens. It's what was referred to as the exchange of populations. A lot of Greeks know about this, not everybody does. This is an incredibly vital thing to understand in the concept of understanding the history of Greeks within the last 100 years. It's something that happened or culminated in, in 1923 uh, with the Treaty of Lausanne in this treaty between Greece and Turkey. And this affected 1.6 million people 
the majority of which, 1.2 million estimated, were Greek Orthodox Christians and upwards of 400,000 Muslims from Greece. Now, what this caused was a forced ethnic cleansing, forced ethnic cleansing of Greeks from Asia Minor and forced ethnic cleansing of Muslims from Greece. Keep in mind, this is not that the Turks are being sent back to Turkey, and it's not that the Greeks were being sent back to Greece. They were neither ever from those countries. They were natives of Greece and natives of Asia Minor, but they were being forced out of their homelands to go to a foreign land based on their religion. And so the Greek Orthodox that were sent out of Asia Minor were coming from places like Eastern Thrace, uh, from Pontos, and from the Caucasus. And these were people that didn't only speak Greek, also spoke Turkish and spoke other minority languages, but they were forced to go to Greece. These were some of those communities within Asia Minor and in the Caucasus, and you even will notice on the other side of the Black Sea in uh, modern day Ukraine of different communities that were forced out and were forced into Greece. This map is of a zoomed in version of Northern Greece of where refugees were settled. Now this information I just wanna point out comes from Athanasios Stavradoukis from the University of Yanina. And this is a really amazing source because it's a, um, you can actually manipulate the map and click on different communities as well. Why does this history matter for Greeks? This matters because it's the history and the story of you because Greekness is relative to the time period and your ethnicity results are going to vary accordingly. So let's try to move forward here a little bit. When we're looking at our ethnicity results, we have to remember that this is only the DNA that's inherited from our ancestors. It doesn't actually represent all of our ancestors that we have because we only uh, receive half of the DNA from both of our parents, which means we've lost 50% of our ancestry as it's been passed on from each parent. Keep in mind also that the science used by our DNA testing companies is evolving and so the ethnicity results that we're receiving are also going to be tweaked over time. The sample populations that are provided by each company differ in size and in representation. So different companies, for example, MyHeritage has a larger sample population from different parts of Greece. So you might notice if you test with MyHeritage, you're gonna get a more specific regional representation of where your ancestors are from. Keep in mind also that the history of human migration, as we've choked, talked about before, both chosen and forced migration is complicated and that's going to be represented in your ethnicity results. So as Carol asked me, what are some of those ethnicities that are going to show up uh, that are common for Greeks? The first of course is going to be Greece and 23andMe shows that as Greece, Greek and Balkan and ancestry DNA shows that as Greece and Albania and they also have a smaller region that's uh, called Greece, Turkey, and Albania. You're also going to see Italy, which is demonstrated as Southern Italy on ancestor DNA often. And this could be caused by migration or be an issue of sample populations or more representative of the fact that Southern Italians are predominantly of Greek heritage, more than the fact that you have Italian ancestry. It also could be that science is not yet able to distinguish Southern Italian and Greek heritage. Greeks are also going to see Middle East, especially if they have Cypriot or Asia Minor ancestry or Greeks from places like Alexandria. You're gonna also see Turkey in the Caucasus uh, if you have Asia Minor heritage or Pontus heritage. Keep in mind also, this does not mean Turkish. It means that your DNA is similar with those of modern day Turkey, which remember people in modern day Turkey used to be Christians that spoke other languages. Also, you're gonna see the Balkans. You might see Cyprus, especially if you're Cypriot. Uh, this was a recent update on ancestry DNA. And you also might see European Jewish DNA because of the process of assimilation. Remember, Jews have been present in modern day Greece since before the time of Christ, which is why St. Paul went there to begin with. Um, and you're also going to see uh, other communities, as I said, Romaniotes and Ladinos, who are different uh, ethnic groups of Jews within Greece. And then you're also going to see small percentages that may be just outliers, um, or they also might be evidence of particular DNA from particular ancestors that were passed on, especially if you see that small amount 
shared among various members of your community. Some people, for example, might see Iran or Persia, and this might be more representative of further East Asia Minor ancestry. And you're also gonna see genetic communities, especially on ancestor DNA of Greece, Turkey, and Albania. Here's an example of a person that has ancestry from the island of Kos in Greece. This is an island in the Delta Canisa uh, off the coast of Asia Minor. And you'll notice it says Greece in the Balkans, Turkey, Italy, Middle East, Europe, uh, Eastern Europe. Now these percentages and uh, were actually recently updated in the last year and a half. So on this slide, here is how DNA results were updated for a person from Kos from uh, 2019, 2021. And this shows why you need to keep going back and refreshing over in, in a couple months to see if it's changed. Because on the left, you'll see Greece and the Balkans went from 35% to 43%. You'll see uh, Turkey and the Caucasus changed uh, to from 31% to seven, as that was redistributed amongst Southern Italy and Cyprus, because Cyprus was a new addition. This same individual had their DNA results uh, moved over to MyHeritage, which is, uh, they did that for free. And their results uh, show Sephardic Jewish ancestry and West Asia, which means uh, Asia Minor, also Italy. But the bonus is that they also break it down to not only Greece, but Aegean Island and Western Turkey, which is very accurate because they were from Kos. So that's a unique aspect of my heritage ethnicity results. Now, what if you're not entirely Greek? What if you have only one Greek parent? What might your ethnicity results look like? Well, you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to some of those markers. For example, Greece and Albania, Southern Italy, the Balkans and Northern Italy, all of those combined are going to represent your Greek parent. So you don't wanna say, oh, I'm only 30% Greek or I'm only 42% Greek. No, you are 30 plus 18 plus two plus one or 42 plus two. And you're gonna see you know, 45 to 55% ethnicity results coming from one parent or another. It's not gonna be necessarily perfect 50-50. Now, what about someone from Cyprus? As I mentioned, Cypriots recently got a great update on ancestry DNA, where now you can actually see Cyprus being represented. So here's some examples of people from Morfu. Uh, there's an example of someone who's half Cypriot, half Asia Minor, and half Cypriot and half Greek. Notice the person that's half Asia Minor. So remember, Asia Minor meaning Orthodox Christians from Asia Minor, their ethnicity result came up with 41% Turkey in the Caucasus and 10% Middle East among others. And so that's very clearly Asia Minor. And then the same thing when you're looking at the person, these two people on the bottom that are half Cypriot, they're showing 41 to 50% Cypriot, but they're showing large amounts of Southern Italy and also Greece and Albania because people from modern day Greece are gonna show more Southern Italy and more Greece and Albania as opposed to Cypriot or uh, Middle East. Now, I want you to look at this here uh, to see if you can guess, now that you've seen what some of these ethnicity results look like, can you guess um, which of these people was Cypriot and which person had something else? So here's an ethnicity result. You'll see here 88% Cyprus and 12% Middle East. So pretty Cypriot, right? Now look at this other person. It's showing 58% Cyprus, 20% Greece, 15 Middle East and 7% Turkey and the Caucasus. Now this is actually a person on the right is the granddaughter of the person on the left. And so the person on the right has one quarter Greek and three quarters Cypriot. Their heritage is actually from modern day uh, Turkish occupied Famagusta, which is Angastina or Amohostos. Now test your skills again. Now that you've seen some samples of various DNA results for Greeks, can you tell where this next person's family comes from? First, I'm gonna show you their ancestry DNA results and then 23andMe results. And then I want you to think in, to yourself where they're from and then I'll tell you. So as you see here, it shows that they are 54% from Greece and Albania and 44% Balkans, 2% Cyprus. Hmm, interesting, right? Balkans and Greece. 
And then on 23andMe, it shows 100% Greece and more specifically narrowing down to Peloponnesus and they narrow down to different regions within Greece. Where do you think they might be from? You might think Greece, maybe Northern Greece, something like that, right? Well, they're half Greek and half Turkish. This person's father has one parent from Evia, the island near Athens, and the other parent, uh, grandparent is from Agios Nikolaos and Mani and the Peloponnesus. And their mother, her parents are from Turkey, um, from the Marmara region. And their family history is that their ancestor was actually a, a Pasha that was sent from Turkey to the Balkans. And then they were expelled from the Balkans in 1912 to go to Turkey. What does that tell us? That tells us that most likely their heritage was native Balkan, but Muslim. And then they were expelled to modern day Turkey. But it also tells us of the shared heritage between modern day Turks and modern day Greeks. And so when you see 100% Greek results, it's complicated, isn't it, y'all? So that's a reminder that ethnicity results are only estimates. And for example, people from Kos and Hios, I've seen very similar results in the amount of Italy or the amount of um, uh, Turkey or Asia Minor. And this doesn't mean that you're Italian or Turkish. It means that you're Greek. It just means that DNA estimates are estimates. And this is really only the iceberg of how we can use DNA for genealogy. And I'm gonna have to move forward because I'm running out of time, but I'm gonna see how much I can get through with this for y'all today. Because the most important thing that makes using DNA test results the biggest, you know, the best work, uh, bang out of your money ever is using your DNA matches. And I'm not even paid to say that. I don't work for Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, or MyHeritage, but I would say it's the best money I've ever spent because it can help confirm your family history. It can help refute your family history, and it can also help find biological family, whether unknown by adoption or not parent expected or situations where someone isn't the parent that we assumed they were. On Ancestry DNA, uh, you can look at your DNA matches in all sorts of different ways, and you can filter them, you can search them, you can group them with different colors, and there's page after page of results that you can see. When you're looking at your DNA results, it's going to look like this, where it says, for example, this person shows that they have a brother, close family to first cousin, first to second cousin, and you can match with different, uh, your own groupings. Now, I want to focus a little bit on this slide a little bit, because I want you all to to think about this. So if you've fallen asleep or you're zoning out, come back to me because estimated relationships are incredibly important to understand when looking at your DNA test results. You're gonna see, for example, on Ancestry DNA that you can see someone matched as a parent-child relationship. That's based on the amount of DNA that you're sharing with that person. Parent-child relationship can only be that. And then a full sibling relationship, it's going to be very accurate. If it says full sibling, that's what they are. But then it gets more complicated. If they are under a list that says close family, but it doesn't define it anymore, it's because they cannot define it anymore because certain relationships have the same amount of shared DNA. So for example, when it says close family, it, it'll then say close family to first cousin. That relationship could be nie your niece or nephew. It could be their, your aunt or uncle. It could be your grandchild or your grandparent. It could also be a half sibling. So it's very important to know who that person is, how old they are in relationship to yourself to determine what those relationships might be. Similarly, a first cousin relationship could also be a half aunt or uncle or a half niece or nephew or a great niece or nephew, or they could be a full first cousin. So things get more complicated as you get past the first cousin relationship. Um, and that's why using charts like this one from the Shared Centimorgan Project are going to be really useful for you in determining these relationships. This is uh, an older version, the, the most up-to-date version you can find from dnapainter.com, and it's the uh, version four uh, from Blaine Bettinger. Now, when you're looking at these uh, matches, you're gonna wanna look at this, something called Centimorgan, CM. And this is how you can see your relationship. This is how a relationship is predicted. So for example, this person, uh, P and R, 
share 230 centimorgans, this measurement of DNA. Now, that amount is estimated to be a second to third cousin. And if you look at this chart from Blaine Bettinger, it tells us that a second cousin has, on average, this amount of DNA, uh, 229 centimorgans, with a range of 41 to 593. I don't want to get too specific, but to point out, this is how those relationships are predicted and, and given to you in these results. You can view your match and see a lot of other details by looking at each match, and I can't get into that with time today. But there's other helpful information, um, like their family trees that they're going to have on there. And you can also look at their ethnicity results to see, if, let's say, if you're only part Greek, but you want to look through your ethnicity results and your, your DNA matches with those that also have Greek heritage. You can look at their ethnicity on that tab, and you can also look at the trees that they have or the shared matches that you have with you and them. So this is what it looks like when you're looking at your match, the ethnicity is in the center and the shared matches are all to the right. Now the shared matches is where things really get interesting and it was really important for those of us that are trying to find our family, try to learn more about our ancestry. We really need to be paying attention to our shared matches with any particular match. That means the people that you and this other person both match. That means most likely the two of you have a shared, the three of you have a shared ancestor, but not necessarily. So it's still important to work through your shared matches and to sort them. And you can sort them in different ways. Uh, for example, using different colored dots on ancestry or stars. And it's also really important to use the notes where you can write a note about that person and how you think you might be related to them. And you can work on that in all sorts of different ways. Uh, my recommendation would be find someone that you know how you're related to already, and then go to the shared matches with that person. And then you'll know, okay, they probably, all of these people match in the same way as I matched my first cousin that's on Ancestry, for example. Um, so it's a, a helpful tool to use with using these groups. Again, don't have enough time today to go into this for detail. Um, and also writing notes is really important to not forget how you are related to someone because you, you looked at them a couple months ago. Now, remember to connect with other people on Ancestry or 23andMe or MyHeritage. You want to contact them to find out how you may want to work with them to learn about your shared ancestry. So always remember to go back and check your messages because you may have unread messages for years and you've missed out on years of connection. So treat these messages as you would have an email or a voicemail and be quick, but also tell an appropriate amount of information. So for example, if you're writing a message to someone, um, start off politely. Say, hello, hi there, cousin. Um, I see that your test for this person matches my test for this person. And we share all these different people. And I think that we're related through the Papadakos family from Egina. And then that gives them some information to work on and then they can write back to you. And I always try to keep it short and sweet, um, but as specific as possible. And that way they don't have to read this long message from you. And when other people aren't getting back to you, it might be because they haven't logged in in a long time, or they might not even know that they have messages. They may have only tested to look at their ethnicity results, not because of genealogy. But if they don't have a tree, there's still other ways that you can figure out who they are. Um, and maybe I can talk about that in another presentation another time, how to figure out who your DNA test results are or uh, matches are so you can work uh, with that DNA match even if that person isn't very helpful uh, in working with you. So to summarize for us today, DNA testing is, a, is as helpful as your tree is full. So you need to work first on your family history and take a DNA test because these complement each other. Greek identity is complex and is much more diverse, the concept of being Greek, than most assume. Your Turkey in the Caucasus does not mean necessarily that you have Turkish ancestry. It might, but it probably just means that you have Asia Minor Greek ancestors. So work with your DNA matches, explore the tools that are available on all the various product, products, and include your DNA matches in your tree. DNA testing is a huge resource for anyone researching their family. And again, thank you for listening to me in a second presentation. If anyone wants to learn more about DNA testing or would like some more advice, 
or um, you can contact me with orthodoxgenealogist at gmail.com. Orthodoxgenealogist.blogspot.com is my website. You can find me at, on Facebook at The Orthodox Genealogist or on Twitter at Sosa and Kiria. So thank you for listening, and I hope that you will join me in connecting with families and encountering our ancestors. Sam, that was phenomenal. Oh my gosh, thank you too much, so too much. much. To say, too much to say, too little time, but I, I hope that y'all were able to get something out of it. Absolutely. And the beauty, of course, is that these um, sessions are all being recorded. So anyone with questions or that, you know, maybe they didn't understand something or they didn't know if they heard it correctly, it's on the video and it will be there on the Greek Ancestry website. This, uh, these sessions are not going to be coming down at all. So thank you, Sam. You have really enlightened us. And I think you have done an incredible job with the historical aspect of showing why we have such mixed ethnicity. Um, it's just so valuable. Thank you again for being with us.